Today's topic, we're talking about TCP sequence numbers and why they're a critical component in TCP delivering reliable data to the other side of the connection. The way TCP does this is that the sequence numbers represent data being sent from one side of the connection to the other, and the acknowledgments that the receiving device sends acknowledges that the data has been received. Now, sequence numbers are in order, and they have to be in order. Well, TCP can handle out-of-order sequence numbers, but it's definitely a good thing that TCP, TCP definitely wants sequence numbers to be in order in sequence because sequence numbers represent data which for every one sequence number represents one byte of data okay so to demonstrate what i'd like to do is pull up a capture that i i uh, created a little earlier today of a um of of let's see sequence number there's the right one and what this is is i sent a five million byte file from scrap iron to Destro. Now I didn't send five megabytes and I'll show you why here in a second, but not five megabytes, but five million bytes. And I used Netcat to do this so it's nice and clean. There's no back and forth protocol negotiation. There's no authentication. There's none of that stuff. It's just straight send bytes in one direction. And what this is known as is a bulk transfer. A bulk transfer simply is, um, where one device is doing most of the sending and the other device is doing most of the receiving. So it's the the opposite of that is known as an interactive TCP session. Interactive is something like Telnet or SSH. I'm going to go into that um, in a later video because that's when this kind of demonstration gets a lot more messy. But this is a bulk transfer and I'm sending from the client scrap iron to the server Destro. Okay, so in this capture, what I like to do is actually cut the capture in half in order to demonstrate. See, we have, I, I've added a sequence number column, length column, act number. I added a bunch of different columns to my custom TCP, uh, Wireshark profile, and it still looks kind of hard to read. So let's cut the capture in half and just do a, and just look at the source, scrap iron, apply filter as selected. And here we go. So now we just have the sending device, just the client who is sending the data. Okay, so here's what we got here. This column represents the amount of data in bytes that are contained in one chunk. Now I'm, I'm going to refrain from calling each one of these packets. These are not packets. These are actually multiple packets. So I'm going to try not to call them packets. So this is just a chunk of data that TCP is sending. So what we have here is starting off at sequence number zero. So that's our starting point. So that's our beginning sequence number. And then because of it, the sin packet actually represents one, it increments to one. So the sin packet, it re increments to one. I'm gonna go into that in more detail when I talk about the three-way handshake, but just know sequence number equals one. Now, this is the first actual chunk of data being sent and notice it's sending 7240 bytes so you what you do is you in this say this was a packet what you do is you take the beginning sequence number now the sequence number that you're seeing represents the first byte in a packet so in this case it rep the sequence number of one represents the first byte in this chunk of data that's being sent so you have one plus 7241. What is the next sequence number going to be? 7241. So 7241 in this next chunk is represents the first byte of data, which is also sending 7240. And so the next one is 14,481. So this is how this is how sequence numbers step through. You add the current sequence number plus the amount of data in, in each packet or chunk that, that we're dealing with here, and that is going to equal the next sequence number. And coincidentally, it's also going to equal the acknowledgement number from the other side, which we'll look at here in a second. But it sequence numbers are simply going to advance in this way. So you add this number plus this number equals this number. This is how sequence numbers advance. They advance based on the amount of data. Now, I forgot to mention, this column represents the amount of just 
um, just payload does not represent header information. So I have another column over here. Now this is the full length. So this includes everything, IP header, TCP header, even the layer two stuff. Um, but this column right here is just data. So look down here and this is where I got that from. This is how I created that. So if you right click, apply as column, and that's how you can create your own column of just the data. Now in encrypted transmissions, you can't really do this. Actually, you can't do this at all because it's encrypted, but you, you, you kind of get the point. Since this is just Netcat, I can do this sort of thing. So, and, and it's just really for demonstration purposes. So we're just dealing with the amount of data. So I sent a 5 million byte file. So if we scroll all the way down, have a little hiccup there, it looks like. What do we end up with? The ending sequence number is 5 million and two. Now remember the one, the, the SIN packet's equal to one sequence number. And also this guy right here, which is a fin, it also equals one sequence number. So we have the data plus the SIN plus the fin equals 5 million and two. Okay. So that's how the sequence numbers advance. Now, if we cut the connection in half, let's clear this display filter. And let's look at the Destro side of the connection. And we'll source Destro apply filter as selected. Now this is the receiving devices side of the connection. Now, now we're just looking at the receiving side of the connection. Sequence number starts at zero because it's a SYNAC. It also has a SYN packet in the SYNAC. It increments to one. But notice it the sequence number column just stays one stays all one all the way down and just ends at one. The sequence number does not advance on the receiving device because the receiving device is not actually sending everything. So with Netcat, it's just straight plopping data onto the other side. So there is this Destro is, has not sent anything. The only data really it sent was the Synac. So it sent nothing. Therefore, the sequence number does not advance. However, what does advance is the ACK number. Now, acknowledgement. Now, every packet is basic. Yeah, every packet is basically an acknowledgement because every packet has the ACK flag set. So if you look at the TCP header, the ACK flag is going to almost always be set. Now, the only time that's not true is within the initial SYN packet. Um, of the client. So you're going to see the ACK flag set all the time, every time. Now, however, the ACK number is represented by, let's the acknowledgement number, here we go, 4345. Now that is going to be the amount of data, the, the sequence number that it is acknowledging. Actually, it's going to be acknowledging that amount of data it has received to that point. So this first one that we're looking at 4345 means that this guy right here, this packet coming back, sending from Destro is receiving 4,345 bytes of data. And it is acknowledging that yes, it has received 4,345 bytes of data. This one down below it is acknowledging that yes, it has received 10,137. 14. So this is what we know known as cumulative, cumulative ACK. Cumulative ACK means it's ACKing, it's acknowledging everything up until this point. So, right, okay. And the reason why this is an advantage is because acknowledgements actually don't have any form of protection against loss. So let's say if this guy gets lost, well, who cares? It doesn't really matter. I mean, this thing could get lost in the network. I mean, loss is a normal thing in all networks. So if this guy gets lost, well, here's one right after it that's going to acknowledge um, everything before it. So this guy right here is acknowledging everything before it. This guy right here is acknowledging everything before it. So it doesn't really matter if one of these gets lost. Where it does matter is the more complex side of TCP when we deal with things like congestion control and yeah, it gets, it gets really hairy. Acknowledgements do a lot more than simply acknowledge data. They provide network telemetry for the sending device. They provide a lot of information back to the sending device to tell it to either speed up or slow down or 
yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole here. So let's, we'll just stop right there. But yeah, acknowledgements want to be coming in as quickly as possible. And typically, so this is Linux, this is a Debian based box, and it is going to be set to on a bulk transfer to be acknowledging every two packets. Okay, now we can see here that that's, it's definitely acknowledging more than two packets at a time. However, we're not dealing with packets here. I'm going to, I'll open up a different, in a minute, I'll open up a different capture that we have it actually, it's actually going to be an accurate representation. However, these act, act numbers are cumulative. They're moving up, they're advancing, just like the sequence numbers did on the other side. And what do we end up with? The final act number is 5 million and two. So let's go ahead and shut this down. Or, get rid of the display filter and try to step through this. Okay, so sin, synac, ac. Okay, so here is the first data packet. Starting off at sequence number one, it has a payload of 7240. Okay, the next sequence number. So it looks like we're sending a lot all at once. So scrap iron looks like it's sent a lot before the first acknowledgement comes back. So that's kind of cool. And then Destro is acknowledging 4345. So Destro hasn't even gotten a chance to acknowledge all of the data yet. So it looks like at this point, 14,000 bytes or more than 14,000 bytes have gotten to Destro, but Destro only had the ability to acknowledge 4345 of that. But rest assured, we are definitely going to be acknowledging. It's a little bit delayed, but we're talking, oh geez, yeah. 12 mic 12 microseconds so yeah we're we, it's this is a re, this is a gigabit network so all these things are just tiny deltas but acknowledgements are coming in and they're acknowledging the data as quickly as possible typically it's going to be like i said it's going to be acknowledging every two packets but it doesn't have to it can acknowledge every three four but having those acknowledgements coming in as quick as possible means that the sending device has that updated information, which I'll go into later. Um, so that's how this works. And so if we scroll all the way back down to the bottom, we have sequence number 5 million and one act number, which this packet actually, see, or yeah, not packet, but chunk has a sequence number. So 5 million and one, and it's got a fin in it. So the act number is 5 million and two. The final sequence number is that blah, blah, blah. Okay. I think you get the point. So what that was, was a really ideal capture. So that was a perfect file size. And that was the perfect application to send because it was very unidirectional. Only, only data, data was only being sent in one direction. So what I'm going to do is let's look at a more real world capture. And where was it here? Book transfer. Okay, so what this is, is a um, an HTTPS, so there's SSL involved, and it is a going to an internet destination. I'm just downloading a Debian ISO here. But so you'll notice there's more back and forth. Now, how do you, how do you, how do I know this, right? So if we cut the connection in half, just like I did before, let's see, source, this guy. Let's, let's cut the sending device. In this case, the sending device is the internet device. So it's the in server on the internet. So, and I'm going to, if I can figure out how to do my own thing here. Here we go. Apply filter as selected. And it's a big file, so it's taking a second. There we go. So destination scrap iron. So what we have here is this is the device where the sequence numbers are incrementing, but we also have ACK numbers here. And why? Because this was um, scrap iron, my client was doing its protocol negotiation. So it's doing all its SSL, SSL stuff. And so that is why we have an ACK number of 518. And we actually now increment up to an ACK number of 1043. So there must be a 1043 bytes that my device, my client had to send in order to negotiate the SSL stuff or the TLS stuff. Okay. Um, Anyway, so n what we have here is now the sequence numbers are going to be advancing, but this is a bulk transfer portion of this capture. And notice the ACK numbers don't go anywhere. And let's see if they stay at 1043 for the rest of it. Yeah, 
yeah, they stay at 1043 all the way to the bottom. But these sequence numbers, I am sending, I think this is like a, it's a hundred megabyte file I downloaded. So it's going to get huge. So there we go. So sequence numbers are advancing for the duration of this capture all the way. And so what you're going to see if I do, if I set the source to my, um, to my client here, you'll see, of course, the exact opposite of that. So let's do that source. And so what we should see is the exact inverse of, here we go. So the sequence numbers are now going up because it looks like this guy, right, this packet right here actually must contain 518 bytes. Um, and then this one right here must contain the remainder, whatever the difference between 1043 and 569 is. But then the sequence numbers don't advance because this is the receiving device. However, the acknowledgement numbers do advance as predicted. And they're probably, they're probably advancing at the equivalent of two packets per um, per. So if I were to take a calculator and I'd minus this number, 24,758 minus 21,862, it would probably be the equivalent of the payloads of those, those two packets, which in an HTTPS connection is, I think, 1,448, I believe, is going to be the actual payload size. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll look into that. But anyway, that should be the equivalent of probably two. Maybe not. I'll have to take a calculator, but it's going to be two or three. And it's going to, the ACK numbers are going to advance until we get all the way down to the bottom. Now, what you'll notice, looks, looks like we got some. Huh. Okay, cool. Had some packet loss. Anyway, maybe I'll save that for a later video. But um, one thing that... I did not bring up is the fact that these are what you're seeing here are not the actual sequence numbers. What you're seeing here is something known as relative sequence numbers. And the reason why Wireshark does this is just to simply make it look easy. To start with zero is easier than to start with. Let me show you when I turn off relative sequence numbers. It's easier to, to look at than this. This is the 32 bit number. Now, they increment in the same way. Notice it increments by one because that's a SIN packet. And then it's going to increment in the exact same way. However, its relative sequence numbers are, are on default because it's just easier to, to read. To do sequence number analysis, it's just simply easier to read. Well, what this is is known as the initial sequence number of this side of the connection. Let's get rid of the display filter. And you'll see the initial sequence numbers of this side of the connection. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail of about initial sequence numbers, but these are the zero points. These are the starting points. Well, initial sequence numbers actually have kind of a, a colorful history that I'm going to do an entire video on because it's actually fairly interesting. Well, but these are the starting points for each side of the connection. Each side of the connection needs to have the same stuff. So each side needs to have its own sequence numbers, its own ACK numbers, its own options, its own ports. It, each side of the connection needs its own stuff because TCP is bidirectional. So traffic can easily go in one direction and the other simultaneously, and TCP handles it. So it needs its own stuff. So these are the initial sequence numbers for each side. So I think that just about covers it. The next video I'm going to do will be a look at interactive TCP sessions. So I think I'll probably capture Telnet because that's really easy to see what goes on there. Because interactive sessions, um, a different set of rules take place because there's much more back and forth. So different things have to happen. So anyway, so I think I'll stop there. I hope you learned something. Thanks for watching.